make sure that we are we're about to go live all right waiting for it to click in all right everybody what's up what's happening this is gabe rodarty with vertical house buyers and uh we are coming to you from uh, north houston real estate investors and uh just having an awesome night tonight guys we have scott horn here who's just an awesome attorney um and uh he's gonna go over a lot of cool things with tax liens all types of liens and how we could be producing and, and making money with those liens so let's make sure that we got all set up you guys have the screen over here to the right you guys still good yeah natalie yep we're good okay so let's go ahead and um make sure i got it on my other screen here all right guys so um just a little bit about us because you're on our page right now um North Houston Real Estate Investors, we've been doing this for over four years now, and uh, it's been a blast. We, we meet every Monday, or not every uh, second Monday of the month in the Woodlands, um, off of uh, at a Holiday Inn Express, or we, just one of the hotels that are up here. And uh, we bring in speakers, we talk, we go over investing ideas, we network. And so this is the meeting right now that uh, we normally do once a month. All right, so here's a little bit about us and what we do. Oh, let's back up a second. Uh, here we go. So uh, what we do is our purpose is to create great content and to educate and to build. Uh, one of the things that I needed in the beginning is just somebody to help me, guide me in real estate investing, uh, just lead in small little areas. I knew how to do the work. I just needed someone to help me grow. So... Um, that's one of the reasons why we want to keep this thing going and keep helping other people and just give back to the community because it just helps the community to be a lot stronger and the investor community to be stronger. Uh, another thing is just to create positive environment. Uh, we're always helping each other grow. If you need anything, we can help you out. Um, and then also uh, to keep things very practical. Um, before we talked, um, Scott and I were basically going over stuff and sharing um, how we can make this really practical. There's a lot of content, a lot of meat. Uh, Scott does all types of trainings. We're gonna go over that later on. Um, and I'm gonna put a, a link on here also for some of Scott's trainings because his stuff is in depth, guys. Some of his stuff he does for like an hour to a full day. Um, so we gotta be, uh, mute that real quick. Um, so we got to be, um, or we, we got to realize that tonight is very powerful because he's going to breeze through a lot of stuff. If you want more and you want to know how to do this in real estate investing, uh, connect with him and I'll put those links on there. Okay. So keeping it practical, that's really key uh, for all of us in our business. Um, before we go any further, so the vendors is what keeps these things going. All right. The vendors, um, they're our team. These are people that we trust, that we believe, that when we need something, they'll give us feedback in a rapid state. Um, this is something that I think everybody needs to know in real estate, that real estate investing or real estate in general is so much of a team sport. The idea of one person wearing all the hats is really bad idea. Um, you get in a lot of trouble. So these are our vendors. You can see the screen here. These are the people that uh, invest with us, that do things with us on a weekly and monthly basis. We're always doing things with them. Um, if you ask for private money or funds, uh, construction company, insurance, these are the guys that refer you to. We vetted them. And most of them we've been working with for three or four years. Uh, so um, let's go ahead and get Natalie. And uh, I'm going to bring Natalie on first. Natalie. Yep, I'm here. All right, cool. All right. Talk about some awesome stuff that you got going on in the lending because you guys got a lot of cool stuff for seller financing and all types of stuff. I say absolutely. Uh, what we're known for is our, our wrap loan to help you with some owner financing. So I know Gabe mentioned earlier, you guys weren't on maybe yet, but uh, right now it's a hot seller's market. I mean, there's a lot going on in the real retail side of the market. 
And something that I've seen for you guys still wanting to do those fix and flip loans, which we have available and we love doing them for you guys. Uh, one thing that we've noticed is people are starting to overpay for those. So let us be your help. Let us make sure that we're reviewing those deals and doing your due diligence to make sure that those deals make sense for you. So at the end of the day, not all of them are going to work. and You want to make sure they do work. Um, something else during uh, all this COVID stuff is uh, we've actually been rolling out all kinds of new things. So we do have our broker program up and running. So if you guys are looking to broker deals uh, with uh, like new investors or however you want to do it, we have our broker program up and running. And then another thing we have going on right now is um, you guys have been asking for it. Uh, the fix and flip to rental loan one-time close. I say so many people have been wanting wanting that because usually we did a two-time close. Well, we have it available now. We have a one-time close fixed to rent loan. Um, other than that, any questions you guys have as far as lending, give me a call. Uh, my direct line is 713-904-3431. Or just any general questions, um, if you don't want to give me a call right away, you can always visit our website at ils.cash, and that way you have our terms available and anything that's new, we try to keep that as updated as possible. Come on, say your number again, your name and number, so that way we can get that in there, slowly. <laughs> so I'm Natalie with Investor Loan Source. My phone number is 713-904-3431. I'll put in the comments as well. And like I said, any general questions, if you just kind of want to check us out first, that's www.ils.cash. And like I said, I'll put that in the comments for you guys. I'm here to help you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're All welcome. Right. Let's get Andrew. What's up, man? How you doing? What's up, Gabe? Doing well. And hey, everybody who's uh, logged in for the webinar or tuned in for the webinar. My name's Andrew. I'm an estimator for Fast Track Remodeling. And uh, we are still going strong in um, remodeling flips, helping investors out. We haven't slowed down at all during coronavirus. You know, obviously this is a good time actually to actually get deals as an investor. So we're staying very busy. And uh, that said though, if you have a property that's under contract that you guys would like us to do an estimate for, we'd be happy to estimate, uh, do that estimate. Uh, you can reach out to me on Facebook. You can reach out to uh, Fast Track Remodeling uh, through the website, FastTrackRemodeling.com. And I actually heard about Fast Track Remodeling when I went to this same meeting that was in person about a year ago. And uh, fast forward a year later, I'm working with them and they've done about six of my projects as well as an investor. Uh, so we have a very investor friendly approach to the way we do things. We're very uh, exact in, in what we say we're gonna do and sticking to our commitments. As far as the business, we've been in business for about seven years now. And we've done, I think it was like 1,300 to 1,400 houses in the Houston market. So it's, we've, we've definitely put in a lot of work and we've, we've developed a reputation that we'd like to share with you guys. And if you're interested in getting an estimate, just let us know. Come on, man. How are you seeing as far as uh, the flips that are going on? Are you seeing some of those flips with your clients, the investors? You're seeing those fly off the shelf within a certain price range? Um, yeah, we're seeing a lot of houses fly off the shelf priced around like 200, 190. Um, it really just depends on the area. Some higher ARVs are flying off the shelf too. And you just got to kind of be aware of a couple of things. You know, if, if the ARV is pretty high and there's some new construction going on across the road, you're now competing with new construction, right? In some of these situations, but as far as housing and, and, and people buying, we really haven't had uh, as far as our clients really haven't had too much of a slowdown if, if the remodel's done right and it's priced right. Game on, man. Game on. All right, guys. So go go ahead and Andrew, say your name again and then say your phone number for so they whoever's watching this slowly though, so they can write it down and get it. It's Andrew and my number is 713-775-7035. So just okay. reach out, call me or text me. I'll be happy to help and We'll get that estimate to you within 24 hours. Game on. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. All right, guys. The man, Scott Horn. Look at that. <laughs> Why are you shaking your head, dude? <laughs> All right, Scott, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. We're going to pull this thing off. All right. So here we are. Just you and me. 
making it happen. Oh, let me unmute you. Ah, unmute your, your side right here underneath. How about that? There you go. What were you saying? I was saying there are many people in my office who'd like to learn how to just mute me and leave me that way. <laughs> One is sitting right across from me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, man. So um, let's do something. I, I, you kind of hinted on it last time. And uh, I was trying to do this introduction and uh, I botched it because you, you like went off like all the stuff that you do you've been doing this for 30 years so why don't you share with us a little bit about what you do um in brief overview so we can kind of grab a hold of this be happy to and you know i know you said that i was an attorney and the answer of course is yes i am i often find it very difficult when people ask me what i do for a living uh, i don't know if i tell them i'm an investor and a title company guy because we own multiple title companies here in the DFW area, or do I tell them I'm an investor, or do I tell them I'm a lender? But we're all of these. So we are a, a vertically integrated real estate investment operation. We've been very fortunate to do all of this. And my, my heart of hearts is I am a rehabber. I love buying houses. I love the negotiation process. I love the rehab process. Over the course of the last 30 years or so, we have bought and remodeled over 3,500 plus single family homes. Most of those in DFW, some throughout though, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, Corpus, the Valley, Amarillo, Tyler, I could probably go on, the Central Texas area, but I'm Waco, Temple Belt and Colleen. And it gives us a great knowledge base of the Texas marketplace and what's going on in the various cities out there. But we have bought a lot of homes and rehabbed them in that regard. It's been very fortunate to be an attorney to help handle and navigate those items. Uh, from 1997 or so through 2009, we became Texas largest asset-based lender. We probably did over 4,000 loans. Uh, wow. Down in the crash for obvious reasons, we have just reopened again. Uh, our new company is called GOAT Funding. We do property tax lending. So we, we buy and remodel houses. We, we, we finance houses. We do tax lending. We are real estate attorneys. We are title attorneys. Uh, one of the, the things that has been very fortuitous has been that we kind of created that owner finance craze back in 08, 09, when everybody was dying on the vine, including us. And uh, the seller finance world saved my rear when the crash hit because we had so many investors just walk away from their loans, some 130 plus. And the world seemed to be asking for an answer and we were able to come up with an answer here for at least the Texas marketplace. And so since then we've closed about 10,000 creative finance closings for our clients around Texas. So all that simply means Gabe is that over the years we have gained a, a, a large knowledge base of a specific industry. And that is the single family residential industry. Although I know a lot about commercial, that's great. I'm not the commercial expert, but we focus on the residential side. And when you get a chance to do that kind of volume, when you walk some 30,000 houses, because we all know you don't go walk one house and buy one house, you simply sure. get a wide knowledge in the marketplace, what's going on, how our business works, and you know how it changes you know from time to time and our business does morph all the time so that's a little bit about who we are and what what we have done over the years wow so there's a lot there okay so let's let's uh, i got some questions for myself and then we want to dig in so 08 happens you're getting into you're realizing stuff is going on you're saying uh this is huge that you figured this stuff out yourself, right? Now you're doing business way beforehand. No, I figured what out? The That's stuff. The, what did I figure out in 08? Create that my a crystal ball was broken. The what? My crystal ball was broken. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> but you were doing business before. Oh, going back to 1988. Yeah. Okay, cool. 
So you're doing business before, and this is one of the things I wanted to get across today is learning. We're going to go over leans, guys, and we want to. And so, by the way, if you have questions and stuff, put questions in the comments. In the there's a there's a watch party going on. Also on the Facebook link, there's a you can just put questions in there. And I'm watching the questions right now. And if you guys have any questions, let me know. And then I'll ask Scott. All right. And I'll keep reminding us. Um, so what I was going to say is tax liens or liens on the properties, they're, they're there. They're always going to be there. So we're going to go over that in a second. But the really key thing is as seasons go on, I love listening to guys like Scott because he's had to pivot so many times. Right now we're pivoting. You see the other stuff he's doing and he's adding to his portfolio of just different stuff his business does. And so as we listen to him today and we really grab a hold of what he's doing, um, it's not just the technique, it's not just the strategy, it's the wisdom that goes along with it that he's gone through multiple cycles and can navigate through that stuff now. And if I'm not mistaken, you still have to be flexible too, right? I mean, there's still stuff you have to learn. No, it, it is never ending. Things change all the time whether it's the law that changes, of course, the government is always trying to get into our back pockets, right? One way or the other, Well, it's whether it's in the rental marketplace, whether it's in the creative finance marketplace or other items, everybody wants to regulate us. And so you've got to keep that in mind. And as you said, our marketplaces change. They go from a hot buyer's market to a seller's market and to everything else in between. And you've got to kind of navigate those, uh, those changes to stay up with things. Or otherwise you sit back and you die on the vine. And the example I'll use with that was going back in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in August of 08 was when I believe the real estate crash really hit. That's when Washington Mutual went down. Okay. Announced uh, on Fox News. And of course I was watching it about 1030 at night did not sleep a wink that night because I had a $5 million line of credit there. And I'm just going, oh my gosh, what just happened? And um, when, when those things happen, you have to be prepared for whatever is going to be forthcoming. Right. But things will happen in our industry as it goes along out there. So just recognizing some of the changes, being able to adapt to the changes, I think are the important things we always have to consider out there. But when that happened, though, here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, so many investors came to me going, what do we do? We can't sell our houses. We're stuck. But everybody had forgotten about the creative finance world. But as I'm out marketing this, not just here in Dallas-Fort Worth, but around Texas, realtors would just totally close their minds off to that type of a transaction. This seemed to be a huge negative issue they had. And had those realtors just stopped back then and realized that this really was the, the smart thing to do at the time, instead of Texas losing 100,000 realtors at that time, many of those people may have been able to stay in business and learn how to help people navigate through it. They just wow. chose. All right. So this is, this is good. I love this. Um, so let's dig in to this one. Um, what do you call clearing up liens? You've been doing this for a while. It, it's not necessarily a strategy. It's definitely a tool. It is. Right. It's more of a tool than a strategy. You know, in the, in the, for instance, in the title world, we have to, to clean up our title when we get it in. And you come across all sorts of, of issues that can close, that can create problems in the closing process that can right. drag out the closing process. And if you are a real estate investor, we want to be able to put a house under contract, either flip that contract quickly. We want to be able to buy it, rehab it quickly. We want to do something, but we want to control that asset quickly, but it's all about knowing what it is we have to deal with. And, and Gabe, the biggest thing I see so many investors have problems with is the recognition they go out, they'll meet with a person who purports to be a seller of the property who may or may not be the seller or the owner. They might be the seller, they're just not the owner 
or maybe they don't have title yet. And the investor doesn't know how to ask the right questions or what to think about through the process. In addition, so many of them haven't taken the time to research the property through the available online resources that we have. Now, if you're in Houston, the greater Houston marketplace, you've got great access to information online. You get out to some, to suburbia out in a lesser known county, you may not have quite the same options that we have locally in your major primary and secondary uh, cities and counties that are out there where we have access to county clerks websites and things of that nature. Right. But access to information is powerful and you have to know what to look for. You have to know how to look for it. And you have to know how to understand what it is you're looking at. And I find so many investors simply don't know that because they're so hungry to get that deal under contract and start it moving. And then the fallacy is, is they rely upon the title company to tell them all the right. things that they need to do that they should have done from the get go. And of course, all they're doing is delaying issues because they didn't know up front what to look for. Absolutely. I get it, man. Um, so let's go into a little bit of the, what is a lien? So what are we talking about tonight? So what is the main thing that um, stops these transactions? Let's say transactions happening. For those who don't know, we'll do a hypothetical. I get it under contract. I'm going to buy a property. All right. I send it over to title. They open up title and they have a slew of liens on there uh, and different things. So what is this? What, what are these things that I'm seeing on a title commitment? Well, I mean, it could, so in your example, it could be anything. Of course, it could be a, a purchase money mortgage. Maybe they refinanced the house somewhere along the way. And maybe they did a, a renewal and extension. So now you see two liens, the original lien that was renewed and extended and the, the current lien. Maybe somewhere along the way they did a reverse mortgage. I mean, it could be just any type of a mortgage lien on the property, whether it's from a private uh, individual, whether it's from a institutional bank, whether it's from a mortgage company, all these kind of things can exist. I was working on a deal today, Gabe, where the investor didn't know what he was looking at. He told me that the underlying debt had been paid off, but there was what's called an oilty lien between a husband and a wife. That's from a divorce where right. one spouse gives the other spouse a, a note and a deed of trust for their equity in their property at the time of a, of a divorce. But when I pulled up the title work and looked at it, there was an existing first lien mortgage that was still in place. There was a, an assumption deed of trust between the two spouses where one spouse just agreed to make the payments, but they protected the other spouse so that if they didn't make the payments on the home, the, the spouse who no longer owned the property was protected in order to protect their credit. But it was an understanding of what was out there to know how to go negotiate that deal. Do I pay all cash? Do I offer terms? Can I offer terms? And what does it mean? So I had to go through and review this form in order to help them understand what they had to work with. And, you know, again, instead of having to wind up paying all cash, they're going to be able to make a, a subject to offer on this property. And so all types of things like that happen. But when you look at these uh, title commitments out there, Gabe, I mean, there's a myriad of things that can show up, whether it's purchase uh, mortgage liens, whatever that those type liens might be, whether it's um, judgment liens against the seller, whether it's child support liens, mechanics liens on the properties, uh, mechanic lien contracts on the property, uh, there could be various types of tax liens, whether it's a private tax lien company or a federal tax lien, city liens that could hit it out there. And this goes on and on and on. But as investors, what we have to, to do is know what it is we're dealing with, because if we understand what we're dealing with, then it gives us an ability to negotiate our deal with our seller better and maybe to our advantage as well. But if you don't know what you're looking at, you don't know what you're looking for, you simply no, don't know what it is you don't know, right? Right. And so that knowledge base, again, in our industry, knowledge is power. And the more knowledge we can develop, the more accurate that knowledge is we can develop, then the better it is. And over the years, you know, when I got in this business, I have to be honest with you, 
I didn't know up from down. Let's just be, I mean, I was in this business cold turkey. <laughs> Don't laugh at me here, but there was no internet. Okay. <laughs> Don't laugh again. There were no computers. The, the old, what we call the DX88 dot matrix was just coming out. DX88. Yeah. We used to have to use the thing called the typewriter. <laughs> I actually had to go down and actually research you know, things in the law library to know what it was I was dealing with. And they didn't have seminars like we have today. This didn't exist. You know, we had a few meetings out there with local real estate investment clubs that eventually grew bigger and bigger. And of course, even real estate investment club meetings have changed with the times a little bit. And um, you had to go out and work harder to find information. And they don't, everybody thinks that because I have a law degree, I'm a lawyer, that, that is some magic pill to this mm -hmm. industry. It is not. You know, there, you can go to college and get a real estate degree, I believe, at various places. It will not teach you how to make money, though, in our business, right? right. You learn by doing, you learn by gathering the right information from the right people, and you learn by getting out and hustling. And Try not to listen to too much of the, um, I don't, this sounds bad, I don't want to use, make it sound bad, but from the investor scenario, you know, sometimes in, you, you get the blind leading the blind. <laughs> and, and that's and unfortunate, that's just the way that, that works out there, and it does in real life. But access to information, knowledge of what it is we're, we're, we we're doing or looking at or needing to accomplish is what helps us be better than the next guy right right so i think that's an important issue that i want any of those people listening today to understand and it's learning how to to gather that information yeah there are techniques in how do you find a seller i get it there are techniques in how do you negotiate a deal bottom line though is you got to get out and just do it and sometimes that may be knocking on the door right but once you knock on that door, I always tell people in my seminars, you have to know before you go. A real simple saying, you better know what your house value is. You better know what they owe on the property. You better know if there are any liens on the property, what the taxes are. Do your homework. And I think a lot of people shortcut that and they don't know all the information. They're just trying to deal under contract the best way they can. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I was going to ask. I was, as you were talking, I'm writing down some questions, by the way. Hey, thanks a lot, Sandy, for uh, making a comment. She was talking about working with realtors right now. And just, uh, she's been trying to find some realtors to participate in working with seller financing and finding those buyers. Um, and then we got another question, um, that is going on for, um, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll hammer that out in a little bit. He's talking about uh, David Johnson was talking about tax liens with, or not tax liens, hospital liens and how that affects buying a property. So we're going to go into that in a second. Yeah. The uh, hospital lien affects the individual. It really doesn't attach to the property. Okay, cool. It would be a major issue out there for a real estate acquisition. You do see those from time to time though. Now, if the hospital filed a lawsuit and got a judgment lien, now that may affect the property based upon what type of a property it is. So while I'm right there, Gabe, let me bring a point up. Do it. Our business, you have to figure out what type of a property are we looking at trying to buy? Is it the seller's homestead or is it a non-homestead? And of course, those are both very different things, right? Let's go into that right now. So we were talking about that. It's very important to recognize if it's a homestead or non-homestead. All right, so let's dive in. Go there. Well, homestead's easy, isn't it? I'm going to ask you the question, Gabe, because I like to engage, engage the <laughs> audience, and you are my audience tonight. Let's do it. So what is a homestead property? Homestead property is where the, the owner or the person is living in the property. The resident owner is on that property, and they're filing it as their home residence, right? Well, that is right. It may be, maybe they don't live there, but that's the only property. <laughs> it's the only property they own in Texas and it could still be considered their homestead possibly. It's one of those things you gotta be cautious of, but just because 
you have not filed a homestead exemption with the county for taxes has nothing to do whether it's your homestead or not. And I see that to be a, a, a misnomer in the investor marketplace. Well, they haven't filed a homestead exemption yet. Again, so for grab a hold. Say that again? Re repeat that again so we can grab a hold of that. Okay. A lot of investors think that if the property owner has not filed a homestead exemption with the county, it's not their homestead. That's property taxes. That has nothing to do with homestead law. Right. So again, a real simple scenario there, a real simple distinction, but you, I hear that all the time. Yep. Again, that's just a learned thing. You have to hear it, understand it, go, got it. Got it. So you are on point on a homestead. There's a few little nuances, not much. And then of course, a non-homestead property is the exact opposite. It's a rental property. It's a business property of some type. Um, and it's usually they'll usually have, own a homestead and they um, uh, have maybe own a second property that might be a rental property or multiple homes of that nature out there. But the distinction is important, especially here in Texas, on how liens may attach or not attach to those properties. And that's the secret, I think, that you want investors to understand that will help them you know, navigate that a little bit differently because it will affect them and how they negotiate their deal. Totally does. <clears throat> so let's go into that part right there. I have a question down for myself. Uh, you mentioned it a couple of times. So when are you, you, I mean, you're picking up properties for yourself also, right? You're picking up for your company, for the people you work with. Um, with your no, I'm greedy. All me. <laughs> so with the people that you do join. That's not true. What's that? Okay. Um, what, uh, you joint venture, right? You work with a lot of other people. Um, when do you look through the title stuff? All right. You're grabbing a property. Is this something you're looking at beforehand? Um, is this something worth looking at right away? I know when it comes to like IRS liens, tax liens, some of the heavier liens on there that um, people already know of. I mean, we're researching, we're digging in there. We have our people looking on the back end, looking on the county clerk stuff but there's some outlying areas where you can't find some of this stuff. No, you're right. So before we walk out the door to go look at a property, you know, we have checked our comps. We have a reasonable expectation of what the house is worth. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done our homework online. If we have that ability to research it here locally, uh, we know what liens might be out there. We know what the original mortgage might have been. Um, whether that's through looking at a deed of trust or looking at a warranty deed, maybe. We're looking to see if they may have refinanced that property along the way, which happens often. Or in today's world, has there been a loan modification, possibly? And of course, the problem is, is if there's been a loan modification, there's a few banks that don't record their loan modifications. You don't even know it exists, you know, in some cases, unfortunately. If you're in an outlying county, you're kind of stuck and you have to rely upon the seller. And that's where you, you get your technique down by asking questions and hope that the seller is going to tell you the truth. But at the end of the day, either you're going to, have to get a title search done on the property or get a contract and open title in order to get that commitment in to look at it to find mm -hmm. out what might be out there to deal with it appropriately. We're just, I, I was working on a property for a client here in Dallas. I got a call in the day, it was a lot. And he's going, well, I don't know if I want to buy this or not unless I know what the liens are because he's negotiated the price with the seller for X dollars of cash to the seller. But this was a property that had, it was a burnout and the, the city actually demolished the home. Okay. So going, okay, you got those issues. I'm going, you probably have a demolition lien, right? You probably have mowing liens on it along the way. And was the mortgage lien that I'm sure was on the home originally paid off through insurance proceeds due to the fire. Don't know. But you can't just arbitrarily go out there and just hope that these things happen. You've got to do your homework, find the releases. And if they haven't been released, you have to assume they exist until such time as you can assure yourself that they've been removed. And so if you're in counties like Houston, you know, where right. you can start from the Woodlands or uh, Harris County proper, or you're in, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth area up here. County clerk. 
we have access to the county clerk's office, although the Dallas County Clerk's been down for three weeks now, revamping their system. So we're- My we're God, really? The line. Wow. You know, it can get a little expensive doing some homework occasionally because you can't research what you need to research, but you gotta have it. And if you're in an outlying county area, you know, maybe you can strike a deal if your local title company do some title searches or what it might be at, at a lesser cost, or you're stuck asking the seller and just hoping you get good information. Right. And that's really where we wind up, I think, in those kind of situations. So um, what's your perspective? And But you got to open up title either way, though, right? I mean, you're, you're working on... Well, it depends. It depends about title. You know, title insurance here in Texas is a lender-driven business. It is not a buyer-driven business who wants a owner's title policy. We are a lender-driven state so that if you are borrowing money from a lender whether it's a mortgage company, maybe a commercial bank, asset-based lender, private lender, they may want title insurance. They say, if I'm gonna give you $100,000 to buy this house, you're gonna give me a first lien and a title policy on the property. Therefore, yes, in those cases, you get title insurance. On the flip side, if I know things like my seller is the owner, it's a homestead, whether I'm buying the house for all cash, my own cash, maybe even with a private lender I work with who trusts me, and I know how to research my title properly, can I avoid a title company? Maybe. Do I have to get title insurance? Maybe. And when you learn what can and cannot attach to a property, which helps you to really narrow your focus on transactions, then it helps you determine do I need title insurance or not? Now, most of your viewers today, I think probably with their buying a house are, are using some format of cash that's out there. And that cash might be, you know, some type of private capital or institutional capital. And in that case, in almost every case, you're getting title insurance. So you're just doing it. But here in Dallas, when we're buying houses, sometimes if I'm using my, my banks to buy houses with, yeah, we're getting title insurance foregone conclusion, right? Right. If I'm doing creative finance, 90, I'll, I'll tell you, 99.6% of my closings do not get title insurance. But we wow. all do title searches. And so it helps to save the investor capital along the way. Absolutely. So, um, Let's talk about that. So who's helping? Where? So let's say that we're talking with a bunch of investors right now that are looking at buying properties on seller financing. If they know you, they know you through some form of creative financing way. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, if you guys don't, you need to know him. We have his link in the comments. All right. Um, you're going to buy a property, hypothetical, buying a property. You got an investor looking at buying a property. They're going to move it into a seller financing they know, I mean, we just did this with you. So they know they need to figure some stuff out. They give you a shout and say, look, I need to run title on this. I need to run a search. What do I do if I don't go through a title company? Am I paying the title company? What do you suggest, Scott? Well, for that scenario, we, we, we're always going to search title on a property, whether it's a title run and name search, which we can get in our primary, secondary, and usually tertiary county areas. You get outlying areas that might be having to order an abstract through an abstract company, which unfortunately is a little bit more expensive. But we're always, always going to search title. But it's going to start with who is the seller? Do we have a contract? Obviously, they're going to have a mortgage on the property in most instances. So we get a copy of that note and deed of trust from that seller. Maybe we get a copy of their mortgage statements. We don't know what's going on. And we start from there. Once we have that and we know it's their homestead, it limits our focus and what we're looking on greatly out there for liens. Yeah. We can talk about that in a little bit. But um, then we, we, once we have the under contract, then we do our title search and we're going to find out what's out there. And I think when we talk a little bit about homestead, non homestead, what can and can't attach, it'll bring that into focus for you a little bit more out there. But we always want to search title unless you're really proficient at doing it through the county clerk's office. If we're closing through our law firm here uh, in Dallas and we close deals all over Texas, obviously, 
we're always going to get a title search as a fail safe out there. Okay. So uh, once again, guys, thank you for liking and sharing this thing with some of your friends and investor buddies that are out there. Just grab the link, go ahead and share it to them. You can share in your messenger because uh, Scott is just dropping some really cool stuff. And guys, this just began. Like Scott is going, you're good. You're good, Scott. I'm good. All right. So we have a couple questions uh, that is really good to lead to the next thing. I got a couple things. Um, how many times can you file an abstract judgment? The same abstract or different abstracts? I'm sure it's, I don't know. Listen, let me make it simple. So if you have obtained a judgment against somebody, you can have that judgment abstracted once it becomes a final judgment from the court. For instance, on an eviction, it's five days after the uh, eviction, it becomes final by operation of law. If it's a different type of a lawsuit, it could be 10 days or 21 days in JP court. It could be up to 30 days in county or district court. But once that judgment becomes final, you can have the clerk of the court abstract the judgment. That's an inexpensive $5 fee to have them certify the judgment. When you get it, we like to suggest you put the, uh, the defendant's driver's license on there. We want to put the um, last four of their social on there. And then you can record that in deed records. And that judgment is gonna be valid for 10 days from the time that the judgment was rendered. Now, as that judgment becomes, uh, is coming up on its uh, anniversary date, the, the 10 years, you okay. can file that judgment up to a total of 30 years and keep it out there. So three times filing it or three times? Yes, for a total of 30 years. Okay. You can refile it two more times. Okay. So it's a it's a little bit of a hammer you can wield against somebody for trying to collect money. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Luke, for the question. Thanks a lot for sharing, Sandy. Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, who else we have here? Okay. So we have this. This we were going to go into this anyway. So let's let's dive in. Yeah. There is a priority, right, on judgments. I mean, not judgments, but liens. All right, on the, um, what would you call it? A hierarchy, a priority, what comes first, what's more important? Once again, I'm gonna put you on the spot, okay, Gabe? <laughs> you know, we haven't even had a chance to meet yet in person, but I'm gonna put you on the spot. It's just what I do. So I want you to tell me, what do you believe is the first priority lien that could be on a property? First priority lien, in my opinion, from what I see is the mortgage lien. Okay. Lean that there. Okay. Um, I would say there. Yeah. Unless it's an IRS type deal. That's a good answer. You know, right. it's, it's by no means a wrong answer, but what if there is a property tax lien? Yeah. So I would say it's IRS state county mortgage. Okay. Good guess. <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, don't feel like you're the Lone Ranger. Hey, man. I've been quitting my business partner on these things. Uh, I love it. But anyway, this is how you learn. So first off, most of our, of our properties out there, our sellers have gotten a mortgage on the home and they bought it through a mortgage company. Right. And it's going to be in first lien position. The only way it can get knocked out of first lien position is if there is a property tax lien filed. And here in Texas, property tax liens, because those are for the city and county uh, taxes, will leap in front of a purchase money mortgage and become a super priority first lien. Okay. So who it is, what it is. And that's why mortgage companies hate. And when I say that, I mean, they hate property tax companies because it puts them at risk. Federal tax liens are like any other lien out in the marketplace. They don't have anything special to do with the property. But they do attach to all kinds of properties. And so what you look at is a hierarchy and Texas is what we call a first in time recording state. So whoever records their lien first takes priority, plain and simple. You know, if you record it on January the 1st, 
great that somebody records it on January the 2nd, the person who recorded them first, regardless when the judgment was rendered. Wow. Priority because it's, a, it's the time that you record the lien, not when the lien occurred. That's why we're called a recording state. Right. So that's the simplest answer I can give you on that right there. All right, Turner Wright, man, I appreciate you, dude, for asking a question. Um, and then thanks a lot, guys, for sharing. There's quite a, quite a few shares that we have on here. All right, so let's go into, uh, we were going over, um, oh, this is a fun one. What are the three types of liens on a homestead? All right. Pretty easy. Right? This is one of the first things you learn in law school, by the way. They don't okay. teach a lot in law school about what we do, but you do learn a little bit. And so you have to know this because in Texas, our constitution says that on a homestead, only a purchase money mortgage, and by the way, that could be a refinance, okay, be a reverse mortgage, okay, and attached to a homestead, uh, a, a tax lien of some type. And by the way, that could be property tax, like we just talked about, or it could be a federal tax lien. So if you have okay. the IRS money and they've gotten pissed off at you, and they've decided to file a FTL or a federal tax lien or a notice of federal tax lien that will attach to a homestead. And then it is a properly executed mechanics lien contract because that acts just like a mortgage. Now, a mechanics lien contract is not the same as a constitutional mechanics lien. They are different. And this is an important distinct, distinction I want investors to understand. Let's say, for example, Gabe, you're going to build a large addition on your home. You're going to borrow money from a local bank. Maybe you have a first lien with, you know, XYZ mortgage company out there. And your bank's going to lend you $50,000 to put this addition on your home. Well, they want a lien position on your house. Well, the way they do that is through a mechanics lien contract. That is where you make an application to, um, um, to borrow the money at least 12 days in advance. And then you have to close the paperwork within the scope of either a bank, a title company, or a law office. And when you do so, this looks just like a mortgage on a property. It can be for a five-year term, 15-year term, 30-year term, whatever you negotiate with your bank. So that's a mechanics lien contract. Okay. Constitutional mechanics lien is a, a situation where maybe you had somebody put in your heating and air conditioning system and you didn't okay. pay them. You had a roof put on the property and you didn't pay them. Then they file a constitutional mechanics lien. And what's important about that is, is they have very short life. They could have either a one year term or a two year term and then they, they go away based upon whether you have a non-homestead or a homestead property. So when we look at title work, whether it is a, uh, a title search of some type, or maybe it's where we have gotten a commitment and look at this, we want to, first thing I look at is what was the date of filing of that mechanics lien? Because one, it's gotta be filed properly and timely. If it's not, it's null and void. If it was filed timely, then it's got a very specific time frame, And oftentimes these have run, but in the title world, and I'm hoping there's not a whole lot of title people online right now, they simply gloss over this. They say, we need to get a payoff when very, very possibly it's a null and void lien. And I see that on at least- It happens. Every day occurrence out there. It does happen. Yep. So again, just having that knowledge base out there helps you negotiate a deal. You know, I'm not here to tell a seller what their situation is or a buyer, but if we're an investor and we understand things, that may help us investigate our, our deals a little bit differently. Absolutely. And to, to be, um, what's the way to put it? To be looking at it from a seller's point of view. Uh, they're most of the time sellers are looking for help to move on from these type of situations. Uh, we just did one where we helped them clear up um, some IRS stuff, some just county tax stuff, 
and we had some other wild, weird, wild lean that was on there. And we just had to go through there and help them clean that stuff up. They knew beforehand that if that stuff was not clean, they're not going to sell the property. She had cancer. She had to move on. Okay. And so we're in a situation, if you know how to do some of this, you're in a situation to really help a lot of people move on from their properties. And uh, yeah, the benefit is we're making money. We're, this is how my business grows, right? However, this skill set, I mean, if you look at your repertoire of how many people have you've helped move on with as many properties have you done, it's crazy. We really don't see the opposite side. No, you're, you're right. And you know, Gabe, we, we're all in the investment business to make money, right? If you're not, you don't need to be in this business. Right. You have to, that you have, to have that goal to make money. At the same time, when you can learn that it's not just about making a cash contract, buy the house and be done. Right. It's learning how to navigate the situation better. It's learning how to um, ask the right questions up front, learning how to help that seller, whether it is paying cash for the house, helping them to eliminate liens on the property or debts they thought they had that they couldn't deal with. I'm going to give you an example of that here in just one second. Yeah, for sure. Uh, getting them out of a bad situation. What I love about the creative finance world is I get to help a seller who's in trouble so often. I get to help a buyer who's a good buyer who just can't get a loan for one reason it might be. They just want to be a homeowner. Right. Chance to help the mortgage company by not foreclosing on the property. And you actually help the neighborhood because you don't get a foreclosed property, which becomes a blight on the neighborhood and lowers value across the way. And at the end of the day, you do all these things that are positives for everybody. And we wind up getting a chance to make money along the way. Right. I don't know what in the heck is better than doing that out there? It's fun. You know, it's a win, 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 win for everybody. I love it. It's great. Mm -hmm. It's what drives you in this business. It's a big win. We have a, this is a rural area. Um, country area and there are uh just long story short there's about six shotgun homes 1200 square foot uh spread out throughout this different neighborhood three acre five acre lots type deal and um all these houses they have the doors are open the windows are open you can tell and i'm going man this neighborhood needs some reviving here and so just this one transaction that we're going to help the lady move on take sub two clear up a couple liens move stuff on we're going to be able to help do that. And then we're going to start moving down to the rest of the neighborhood. And so, um, and then I'm pretty sure in a couple of years from now, everybody will be happy. So, yeah. Well, and it's just, as you learn more about how to do that, as you, you realize there's more than just trying to make a culinary deal, it's okay to leave a little bit of meat in the bone out there for everybody involved. <laughs> but right. it works. And, you get other referrals and people come back to you again and it makes the business very fun, very rewarding. And you learn how to make a lot of money along the way. Absolutely. All right. So we got a lot of good questions coming in. This is fun. Okay. So um, what about child support? All right. We have a, uh, how hard is it to be removed? Can you remove this stuff? What's going on with that? You can, but let's talk a minute about our wonderful title industry and what they're doing today. Okay regarding child support liens and judgment liens because right. i told the audience the three kind of liens that can attach to a homestead property right and for the most part that is the great majority of what we deal with out there in the marketplace for our homesteads and so knowing that they can attach we go great well the problem is is that the the title industry has got involved and they've said well first off on a judgment lien even though it can attach to a um a homestead we want it removed and by the way about two years ago or so that wasn't the case in the title industry we were able just to insure around it move on not okay. even now we have to remove them wow so knowing how to go through that process helps as to a homestead, it may wind up being a negotiation on a non-homestead property, but they're 
fairly easily removed on a homestead property. On the flip side, uh, with child support, same thing. A child support lien cannot attach to a homestead by operational law. But I don't know anybody really wants to sue the attorney general's office <laughs> to get to move the lien. You know, that's fighting the government, right? That ain't right. no fun. But what you'll find is, is that what, what are they looking at? They're trying to make sure that the bad actor is not getting rewarded. Right. So if the seller is the person with the lien, they're going to want to take that money to satisfy the judgment. And probably in, in reality, that's not a bad thing, right? So I understand what that is. But oftentimes there is no money. Maybe the house is in a pre-foreclosure stage and typically remove that, that child support lien. The AG is not going to force somebody to get foreclosed upon and they will release the liens in many cases. So oftentimes if you've got a situation where there are two parties and one might have the child support lien and one doesn't, finding a way to get them off the property, if possible, before you actually buy it could be a a positive situation. A little more difficult to do, but usually yeah. the AG is going to look at it saying, hey, you know, if you have a homestead and there's a husband and wife and the wife owns half and the husband owns half, the husband has a child support lien from a prior marriage, maybe. You know, so not all the profit is going to the child support lien because half goes to the wife, but mm -hmm. the husband's half is going to be allocated to that child support lien in some format. Makes sense. So it's just learning what needs to be done, how you need to do it, but if there's no money on the table there for the the, uh, the bad actor is not getting anything, they're they're easy easily removed. We can get removed anywhere from seven to ten days typically. Wow. Okay, that's good. All right, so we got some more. Uh, let's see. What's the time frame on the constitutional mechanics lien? What is the time frame? Is it variable? No. no. So on a the mechanics lien, we call them this an MML, um, on a non-homestead property. So it's important to know what kind of property is, it is valid for only one year. By the way, my pause was for my business partner to answer the question and she failed. <laughs> <laughs> two is if it's a homestead property, it's valid for two years. But after those okay. times, they become null and void. So in other words, what, what the state is telling us is, is you want to file a lien like this? Great. But either foreclose on your lien or go file a lawsuit to collect on it. We're not going to allow you to let this lien last forever on the property, you know, for 10, 20, 30 years, whatever it might be. So those time frames are very important to understand that. And it's important to know the time frames for filing. Uh, you can file uh, a mechanics lien uh, on the 15th day of the third month uh, after the work has been completed. So, for instance, if the work was completed on January the 1st or January the 31st, it doesn't matter. It's February, March, April. So April 15th would be the third day, uh, the, the 15th, excuse me, the 15th day of the third month after the work was completed. Okay. So it's just kind of learning to count the time a little bit. And that's why we lawyers go take all these uh, um, continuing education courses on things like this. So we get these timelines in our head down pretty well to learn them as well. All right. I want to make sure everyone knows, guys, this is just the beginning. Uh, if you ever wanted to know more, I'm trying to find the link on my phone so I could share it. Um, if you guys, if you see the link below, it is on there for the owner finance network. All right. This is a, a lot of the stuff that Scott has is right in here. And so um, click on it. He has a training coming up and uh, it's a couple weeks from now. He has a training coming up. It's actually very, it's not even expensive. It's just, uh, I think it's like what, 20, 30 bucks or something like this, like that. I think the one we have coming up is next week i think no, on the 23rd 23rd that's just, our, that's just uh, we're talking title and i'm i brought bring in my two senior escrow officers to talk about that as well and it's just a q a session going through 
what do we see in the title world, how it helps our investors, what what we need to know from the title industry. And it is, it's $20. That's very inexpensive in that instance. Guys, that's so, <laughs> I mean, to know this stuff, it's worth sitting in it. And you know what, you're, you're doing this all online, right? This, this is the online thing. This is my first time ever, Gabe, to do an online presentation of any type of this nature. Really? Or in person, it's a lot more fun to do it things. Is. I love the audience and I love audience participation and whatnot. All right, so we're gonna do that. So that's the 23rd. All right, so let's keep going. So that way I just wanna plug that so that way you guys can see uh, if you had a lot more questions. All right, if someone filed bankruptcy two years ago, is there any way to buy the house subject to before it goes to foreclosure? Well, I mean, you have to ask yourself several questions. So they <clears throat> filed bankruptcy two years ago. Have they right. been, uh, were they dismissed from bankruptcy? In other words, did they not under the terms of the bankruptcy and did, were they thrown out of bankruptcy? If that's the case, then of course the answer is yes, you can because they're no longer in bankruptcy. But let's okay. assume they did file a bankruptcy. It had to be a chapter 13 reorganization for that purpose. And there's okay. still, can we buy the home from the um, bankrupt from the bankruptcy estate subject to? The answer is maybe. Because in order to do that, it will take the, hate to put it that way, that's, that's the answer. <laughs> I was expecting the answer. <laughs> it, it takes the trustee's permission to sell it. So if the bankruptcy trustee thinks that there is some huge um, um, equity in the property, and they can sell that property to get money to pay the other debts and expenses of the bankruptcy estate, you're probably not gonna be able to buy it subject to. But if you can buy it subject to and alleviate the debt of the estate and everybody agrees, then the answer is yes, you can. But it takes cool. the trustee's permission in those situations to do that. <clears throat> How hard is it to do that? I mean- It's not hard. I mean, it's, it really depends on what you have. But if you have a house that's worth $500,000 and they only owe $100,000 on it and you wanna buy it subject to the $100,000 and that's it, that ain't gonna happen. But now if you've got a property and let's say that the debt is 175,000 or 170, maybe it's worth 200. So by the time you sold the property, paid your realtor fees, title fees, yada, yada, you're just near a break even, right? Most likely in those cases, they're gonna let you do the deal. Oh, cool. Unfortunately, if they're in bankruptcy, you have to get permission from the trustee to do it. Otherwise they could nullify the transaction. And we don't want that to happen. No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. All right. That's fun. This is fun. Okay. We got some other stuff in here. And then you have there's something that you, you sent over. I really wanted to go over. Um, so we went over lean priority. That was fun. Mm -hmm. um, we have a guy on here who said that, uh, does lean priority actually have much to do with priority collection? No, not at all. Okay. You collect your lien any way you want to collect your lien. Um, and if, if we hold a lien against a property, say, say maybe I'm a judgment lien holder, Gabe, against one of your homes. Okay. Maybe that home is a rental property, but it's not your homestead. Right. Could I execute on my judgment lien, meaning could I foreclose on it and take the property just like any other foreclosure? The answer is yes. Okay. Um, if I do, if you have existing liens on the property that are senior to my lien, meaning right. for me, then of course I'm going to be buying that property at the auction subject to all of those liens. These are the ones. Okay. Whatever the order of priority might be. Okay. From a collection process, we can collect anything we want to collect. It's just the effort you have to go through to collect it. And are you willing to go through the uh, post-judgment interrogatories and things of that nature or the garnishments or writ of attachments, whatever it might be, to try to collect on your, your judgment? Right. That's a whole other conversation about collections that can be out there, but it's a... It's okay. A, process 
winning the, the lawsuit, winning the battle is easy. Winning the war of collection is hard. Unless is they have attachable real estate. And okay. Then that. Okay. All right. Um, a couple things. Let's wrap up. We got so many cool things to go. We got questions answered. Um, this is a fun one. All right. This is one of yours. Okay. Wills probate. Okay. So uh, is a will not valid without a probate? So you're reading the title. Uh, um, what do you, I went brain dead. Our marketing flyer for the title seminar. Yeah, because it's good. you're going to go. That and I want to let people know, guys, you guys got to be able to be part of this. But he's going to go into really details. So hit this up real quick. So just real quick, what I hear so often, and I hear this from, I hear this a lot of times from sellers that, well, I'm the executor of my mother's estate or my right. father's estate. I go, great. Do you have letters testament, Terry? They go, what? I'm going, well, you say you're the executor. Well, I am. I'm the named executor in the will. I said, <laughs> but have you actually probated the will? Have you filed it? with the court, the probate courts. Well, no, but it says I'm the executor. So therefore I can sign the contract and take care of it. And what happens is, is the seller believes they are the person with the authority to execute the investor who doesn't have the knowledge base to go, wait a minute. Did you actually file this will with the, the court? Because if you haven't filed a, a will of the court, a will is nothing more than just a piece of paper. Right. Absolutely nothing. And right. that's a, a, a knowledge issue where the marketplace doesn't understand that because they're not lawyers. They don't need to know it. And so many investors just don't understand that well enough to answer the right questions up front. That's so true. Yeah. If you answer that question up front, you ask it and you find it out, then you go, oh, well, how long ago did your mother pass away? Because it was more than four years ago. You're going to, have to be outside your statute of limitations to file the will. So now it doesn't matter what the will says. And I have that situation right now, one of my title offices, where the will, the, the, the people died 10 years ago, and the sister was given the property under the will. And, and she's the one who signed the contract, but it hasn't been probated. And there were three children, or not, yeah, the sister of the, 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 the mother who passed away is in the will. But the three children of the mother, because they are the heirs, would be take under the laws of intestate succession. And so now the investor is going, oops, I don't really have this house under contract. Right. The wrong person who doesn't even have the potential ownership owns it. Yeah. And, you know, Gabe, as we're talking about this and we're talking about liens and whatnot you know there is so much to go over and i know we have just really kind of scraped the surface a little bit and and, and it's it's fun to do that and there's so many examples to use because people learn from examples and whatnot too but one of the things that that we do at the owner finance network is we do uh we, we love the tour of the state we do our creative finance seminars we do seminars on liens it's fun to take the experience that we have learned over the years to talk about everything from, from rehab to borrowing money to selling notes to whatever it might be out there into that industry. But this is uh, the, the lean seminar that we, we actually put on is three hours of this hardcore lean information without all of the uh, variables that we go through in a short time like this out there. Right. Totally. Yeah, guys. So if you, um, and, and this is just a cool to have Scott on here and he has a class coming up and he was telling me, Hey, can I, can I share this class? And I'm like, absolutely. Because, uh, I'm going to do it, you know, and I want to be part of it and, and just really grab the team's going to be part of it, uh, because we run into so many things, uh, especially. And so, so I've done, and let's go into how this is going to help us make money because I've done some really fun deals. Um, helped out the sellers, 
made some decent cash and um, been able to move on, helped all parties, like you said, win-win. So what does this look like on the finance, on the money side? Like now we're able to make some cash in a different way. And some of my funnest deals, they took a lot of work, but we made good money. We made more than normal because we knew these strategies. Is this the greedy side of you coming out now? This is the, the, the business owner side of me. <laughs> By the way, as Gordon Gecko said, right? Greed is good. Greed is good. So, by the way, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you even know who Gordon Gecko is? Gecko. I'll, I'll, I, I, got, I got Google. I got Google. <laughs> it's actually a movie character. I'll just tell you that much, okay? Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, with, you know, understanding this process, Gabe, learning what to look for, how to find um how to find liens, how to look at them, how to analyze them properly, to know what it is uh, we're dealing with. So as we're negotiating, all these things add up to help us make money. Uh, my business partner, Susan, and I bought a home here in Dallas over in uh, an area called Las Colinas uh, wow. just under 12 months ago. It was a much bigger home than what we typically deal in. A uh, fun situation where the house had actually been foreclosed on by the HOA for $18,000 of non-payments. Now, there was a mortgage on the property. Gotcha. And that mortgage at one time was up as high as $500,000. Wow. <clears throat> which means it was still out there. Well, along the way, the second lien holder released their lien. The so HOA? No, the, the second lien holder did. It was a $120,000 second lien, but it just went away, leaving a $380,000 first lien. And a prior investor had been negotiating that lien uh, on a uh, short sale basis. Anyway, they were able to get it down to right about oh, $100,000. Hold on. So you're saying, so was that like an 80-20 loan that they did whenever they purchased it? Or what kind of lien was it? Yes. In some format, an 80-20. So exactly. That on point. Okay. Why the second lien holder released their lien position, I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Bank or anything? No, it was gone. Wow. The HOA actually foreclosed. And in working with investor number one, this investor was going through the short sale and they were trying to keep getting the price down more and more and more. And they kept going back to the mortgage company with more issues and more issues and more issues. Some weren't, which weren't too valid actually. <laughs> and there were some liens on the property that did attach that were no judgment liens and whatnot were out there that had to be dealt with. At the end of the day, this, this, uh, this investor number one, as we call them, we're pushing the deal too hard. And the, the, more, the, the HOA said, we've had it, we're done. And they reached out to, to us and we came in and um, we went to, to contract with the original owner of the property who was actually foreclosed on. In other words, the HOA was going to allow them to redeem the property, okay? okay. So they'd have to actually deed the house back because of the foreclosure. Okay. The, mortgage company, we were going to accept what had already been on the table for the short sale. Okay. There's still $36,000 of, of judgment liens that the title company said had to be satisfied. From the HOA? No, from other, um, other yes. outside forces. Wow. So $36,000 of liens. Wow. Now, of course, this is a unique scenario because the HOA want to do this because if they had foreclosed, they don't get paid. If on the other hand, we buy the property, they get paid. Right. So it was a win-win for everybody in this instance. But these judgment liens are out there and the seller and or the mortgage company both were having to deal with them to get them removed because the title company, I won't say their name, said we have to pay off these judgment liens. Yeah. I know it's a little self-serving, but <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. At the end of the day, because this was a homestead property that I was able to verify, 
going through the right techniques, knowing how to remove them, we were able to remove the $36,000 in liens. Beautiful. How did we make money? Well, we got our price reduced on the property a little bit. We helped the seller who saved money. And it became a win-win. And in this case, I mean, we were their best friends. They Absolutely. were able to put eighteen or 20000 in their pocket. It saved us money also through our negotiations a little bit. And it was just like, done. It wasn't anything complicated. It was simply a knowledge base of the industry out there. And you see things like that all the time. Um, I can, I, you know, as we negotiate deals where there are judgment liens on properties or tax liens, you know, I don't necessarily have to share my knowledge base with the seller per se in what is or is not there. It's simply the navigation of it in a, in a proper fashion, whatever it might be. And as I'm doing that, maybe I'm able to negotiate a lower price if I can remove it. Why? If I don't, they think they have to pay for it one way or the other. They're stuck. Right. Well, if I can help them remove it, I can negotiate that better price. And all of these examples wind up putting more money in our pocket at the end of the day. Right. And whether it's learning how to work around IRS liens, how to remove judgment liens, how to navigate child support liens, remove them, whether it's in the, the, the probate world, where maybe you have multiple heirs, but maybe one or two heirs have uh, judgments or various issues that might affect them on a negative basis where we need to remove them, at least from the sale of the property today, what they do between themselves after closing, I don't care. Right. Unless they negotiate their deal. But all of these help us negotiate better deals, act actually capitalize on deals that most people would throw away, which yeah. wind up making money. And right. Because I was looking at these things because these are really complicated things for most folks. Um, so I tell my team, I'm like, look, guys, and I tell realtors, I tell uh, investors, um, newer wholesalers. So if you guys are out there, we're able to help you out. Scott's able to help you out. Um, and so whenever these things come in through the door, I'll tell the team or Maria or Mary Lou, they might text me back and go, man, you got another tricky one again, huh? And, you know, they'll say, okay, here we go. You know, what are we going to do here? And we'll, we'll have to map it all out. And, and we, we have systems down now before it was just hours and hours and hours on the phone, you know, trying to figure out who do we call now that we have some stuff going on, we know who to call at the County. Just that one phone call saves me tons of hours of time of just saying, Hey, can you just look this up real quick? You know, thank you for figuring out that other deal for us. Can you just figure this thing out real quick? Or can you just help me with this thing? Those things are huge. So let's back up a second. The HOA lien that you had, it foreclosed. Okay. That's what you're saying. They foreclosed on it. They took the property. So it was deeded over in the HOA's LLC. Well, yeah. Right? The, L, the, the HOA foreclosed and owned the home. So guys, that's rare, actually. That doesn't happen a lot. So they wanted their money. <laughs> the investor who was trying to buy it, but the investor didn't have, had nothing to do with the HOA. They didn't care about the HOA. They weren't there to help the HOA. They were trying to improve their position and they kept negotiating, renegotiating, renegotiating. And they're going back to the, the well one time too often. You know, and because of that, the HOA has said, we've, this has been eight months, we're done. We just, we want to get this house sold so we can get more HOA dues coming in. And yeah. The HOA. Yeah. And it's rare though, right? I mean, I don't see a lot of HOAs owning property. Normally they're selling it at the auction. Well, oftentimes that, that does happen. And I'll give you an example though. This is just a knowledge base of understanding this, where I had a client who had brand new to the business, had listened to somebody online talking about how to buy HOA liens at the foreclosure auction and how this was going to work out so good for him. So he went down and he bought three HOA liens at the foreclosure auction. So he bought these three properties. <clears throat> the problem is they all had mortgages on them. And he didn't have a clue how to negotiate with the mortgage company. And so what did the mortgage company do? They said, oh, our client was foreclosed upon. Here's the 20 day notice, boom, and they foreclosed, wiped them out of all three deals. 
gosh. He didn't understand how to negotiate with a mortgage company or how to handle things properly or realizing that the mortgage company, those scenarios, they don't have to work with you. They don't have to give you the right to make the payments. They have the right to say, nope, pay us off in full. Right. It didn't have the, the ability to pay off the mortgages in that instance. And they could have been home runs or not so much, but he didn't understand those things going in. And the guy lost like something close to $30,000 just simply by not understanding. And, and so- Right, this, this happened to me. I'm on vacation. We get this house under contract. We're gonna buy it. Lady doesn't even mention, and it didn't even occur to me, we went on vacation the weekend before uh, the first Tuesday. It's not even in my mind because she didn't tell me at all this thing might might or might not go to foreclosure as I'm sitting in front of her at her, you know, in her living room writing the contract up. Mm -hmm. Nice lady. She just didn't tell me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I look and uh, I don't find out until I'm, I'm, we're on... 10 year anniversary type deal. And I, I get this text of saying, Hey, I don't really want to sell anymore, blah, blah, blah. Come to find out it was sold at auction. Okay. Oh and I'm, what's that? Oh my goodness. So I'm like, okay, so the HOA forecloses the, the attorney does the trustee. So he forecloses on a thing. What really stunk is that he, th this was a 10 year battle with this lady. She was trying to make payments. He had, checks on his desk that he didn't want to cash for her because there was some issues there she's like i can show you the checks are there he's not cashing them i'm like okay so anyways there's a bunch of back and forth and okay well the guy who ended up buying it at auction i don't find this out till later on okay until the title company tells me because I, I come back from vacation and they're like hey by the way this was just sold the guy who ends up buying it didn't do the other research I saw that there were other liens and taxes owed on this thing up to $28,000. And I'm like, okay. So uh, while I'm gone, I'm like, I still need to pull title. I'll sort this thing out. The lady's really nice. I was just saying, when I come back, I'll start working on the taxes and everything else and, and the title issues. I knew it was gonna, wasn't gonna be a fast close. Well, um, we were trying to work out the whole thing. The gentleman uh, who owns the property, uh, him and his wife, her husband um, passed away during this whole process. All right. So it makes it even more complicated. And I realized that I could have made this whole thing happen. All right. But I would have taken all of her money to pay off this liens, the debts and everything. And she had a check from the county from that foreclosure there she's like i didn't want to cash it so six months go by or almost six months and i'm like cash that check because you're not going to get any money from me yep. Just cash it and so i get out of the deal well that guy who bought it he didn't do any of his research and uh, i end up talking to him later on uh, like months later after they flipped it and he goes dude we were so negative on this thing we didn't know we had to pay all these other liens because people don't know that stuff you know even though you do a HOA foreclosure, it doesn't wipe out the tax liens. Nope. And it only wipes out anything that might be junior to it, and that's it. You know, I'll give you another example just so your, your audience can listen to this. But so my business partner's very first deal she ever did was a property in North Dallas in a very nice area that the house had a value of about three and a quarter or so. And of course, I come to find out this is a hoarder house. Just, I mean, it was, it was horrible, both on the inside, Google Maps, looking down in the satellite view, it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Even the satellite was looking rough, huh? <laughs> it was bad, uh, but it had potential and there was no mortgage on the home, but the lady had $88,000 of property taxes. Uh -huh. And she had taken out a, a tax lien loan on this. And so as we're, we're, we're talking about this, we have the house under contract. And what's, what's really wonderful to know, you know we, were, we, we didn't have the house under contract yet. 
and my business partner was pretty good at negotiating the deal, but these other investors came in and all they were doing was belittling the seller, down, down talking the house, things like this right. that I don't want to do. And of course, it just really turned her off of these, these, these guys who were trying to buy it. And um, it just brought her to us more. So we went to contract, but this was scheduled for foreclosure. Okay. So we got the, uh, the payoff and we went in and we um, paid off one of the tax lien loans. There were two of them. And the lady didn't have enough information or knowledge base to tell us what really was going on. So we get to closing and our title comes in and I'm told the house was foreclosed on. I'm going, wait a minute, we just wrote a check for $40,000 in taxes. Are you telling me the house was foreclosed on? No, I just stopped foreclosure. And you would think I am supposed to be this great guru of liens and legal stuff, et cetera. But it was two parallel foreclosures ongoing simultaneously. Oh my gosh. And the seller thought they were both the same. She didn't realize they were separate. Wow. And so we, I'm just going, oh my gosh, somebody bought this for a hundred thousand dollars at auction. And now we're going to go down and pay 125,000 to redeem it. Right. Which is how the a tax foreclosure works. Well, lo and behold, we find out that this thing sold at lunchtime in Collin County. Okay. Sold for only $22,000, which was the outstanding balance of the lien, not a hundred, which if it was in Dallas County, it was sold for at least that much. Wow. And as you may not know, Gabe, I am an Aggie. <laughs> and um, I'm an Aggie attorney. <laughs> this happened that another Aggie attorney out of Sherman, Texas had bought this. Really? And, um, that kind of relationship helped me be able to go up. And I just paid him his 22000 plus his 25%. Bought the property back and redeemed it on wow. behalf of the seller that came out of her proceeds in that format. We went wow. on the property, but again, even though I, I know all this stuff, even though I have a good knowledge base, I didn't have the knowledge base to know that there are two foreclosures going on simultaneously and that a seller doesn't have the capacity to tell you that. And so- This is crazy. <laughs> In, in this instance. Wow. No, that's um, be lucky than good, right? That's, that's interesting. You know, you were saying about they don't need, you know, sellers don't might not need the whole thing. You know what I kind of relate it to? And I've just, as you're talking, I'm like, this is kind of like being a credit repair company, credit repair companies. They're not telling you every single thing they're doing to repair your credit. They're not telling you, they're like, Hey, we need this. You need that. And uh, I've never had to use them, but I have talked to them to work with other clients. And they're like, they're just saying, we tell you what to do, but we're not telling you every single detail of what's happening because that's a lot of information and it's overwhelming for sellers, right? They, they, and like you said, they might not even know what's on there, right? So that's one of the things that I see sometimes is that we're just coming in there and just helping them make the next move. And sometimes they don't want to know everything. No, and they don't. They, they, they are looking for a way out. And the easier the way out it is, the better it is for them. And if we as an investor can help our client find that way out, if we can find a way to maximize our profit, whatever that, that mechanism might be, whether it's through lien recognition or otherwise, it works. And it's just a matter of understanding that and finding it. You know, I find that so often out there in the creative finance game where the sellers, they're stuck. They don't have any options. Realtors can't help them because of their situation and position. But we as an investor can help them by understanding what we can do, how we can do it, and how we make it work. And that's why it's so much fun, you know, Gabe, to teach the, the creative finance courses out there around the state to, to open uh, investors' minds to opportunities that they have, uh, how they can work with the sellers, work with the situations, 
how to look at these liens on a property. Because, you know, so often I find these, these properties where there's a first lien mortgage and maybe there is a HUD second lien mortgage. Right. And for those who aren't familiar with that, a HUD second lien mortgage might mean that there was a, a loan modification maybe and that they put the arrearages into this second lien. I've even seen it with a second and a third lien before. And of course, oftentimes, and most often, these are zero interest, <clears throat> zero payment liens. It's free money. It's still a lien on the property we have to contend with. Right. But you understand that the creative finance game becomes one of a cash flow game, not necessarily always an equity game. We don't right. care. How can we maximize our cash flows? And then do things the right way along the way there. With taking over payments on a house without interest. <laughs> Isn't that nice? <laughs> you know, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful game. And by the way, this never existed prior to 2009. Really? Yeah. They didn't have short sales. They didn't, that, that, that term wasn't around. Loan modifications. Yeah, I mean, I get loan modifications from my banks and whatnot. I never saw them with mortgage companies, uh, except wow. on a very, very rare occasion. All this stuff is, uh, you know, all fairly new within the last 10 years or so, based upon our last real estate crash, when all of a sudden everybody started throwing out free money, just like they're doing now with COVID, throwing out free money to everybody as well, right? Um, yeah, I totally hear it. Man, we got some good comments on here, man. We have a uh... This is some of the best information I've ever heard in a long time. It said, I'm definitely going to Scott's class. There you go, Scott. You got some people there. That's from Renee. Um, so we've had some good comments. And uh, thanks, guys, for uh, just tuning in. I want to share. I'm going to do a quick share screen so that way you can see. Um, why don't you go through your class coming up? You see that? Well, I got it. Well, you know, this is just our um, a, a title training we do. Okay. I think investors need to have an understanding of the title industry. Uh, what was really interesting, Gabe, was I had a house just recently that was down in uh, the southeast part of Dallas that I'm at the closing table, closing it for my title officer over in South Lake, and I'm asking some simple questions like, have you ever been married while you owned the house? He said, well, yeah, I was. And this gentleman bought the house in 2001, got okay. married in like 2003. His wife died in something like 2012 or 2013. And then he's selling the house in 2020. And so we get the contract, we open title and all a title company is going to see is seller buy or buys the house in 01. Yep. The deed, he's on the mortgage. Wife shows up nowhere. Seller is selling the home in 2020. There's no wife. Doesn't exist. And but the problem is is you have here in Texas we're a community property state. And so you have to understand how that works because the title companies won't want these issues resolved because that wife may have community interest. And in this case, there were uh, children, three children who lived uh, out of the country who would have a 10% interest each in the property. There are two, two children here locally, one, which is a minor, and this house isn't being sold because of the title issues until we can get all this stuff resolved. But a lot of people, uh, I talked to the, uh, the two investors involved in this deal, they were both wholesalers. It's like, why didn't anybody tell us this information up front? One, one guy knew, and his answer was, well, I thought you'd just pull it up. And it's like, no, there's no way we could ever know about this. Okay. We go through the entire closing process to find out at the, at the zero hour, the house isn't saleable yet without fixing all these issues and potential problems. And we don't want to create a problem for a title claim for somebody down the road. Right. Like this happens. And so the goal of this uh, uh, training is simply to talk with our title officers who see a myriad of stuff from the investor world out there, talk about how this works, what affects it, 
you know, what is it you need to know? It's that old adage we talked about earlier, Gabe, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And the more you know, the better it helps you to navigate what you're doing, better to negotiate your transactions with your seller, to understand the closing processes. You know, the title companies, everybody tries to provide customer service, but sometimes there's only so much things we can do because we're at the mercy of getting information in. We're at the mercy of what is on the commitment and what we can do and things of that nature. And again, as I said earlier, knowledge is power, understanding things. We don't want to go out there and be mean to our, our title officers. You know, right. well, I turned the contract in on Monday. Why aren't we closing on Wednesday? <laughs> and this is what's the expectation is, you know, it only takes two days to get title work in. Why can't we close? And you hear this so often, but it's just understanding basics, timeframes, what has to get done and not get done, uh, how you cure title issues, how you fix things information that you can provide your title office in advance to help your deal move along faster. This is all beneficial to all of us as, as investors out there in the community. And it's you know, one of the nice things about my position in today, today's world is that as I am a real estate and title attorney, so that's great, but I am that investor. I am that lender. You know, I've borrowed up three quarters of a billion dollars from my banks over the years, not counting my private capital sourcing out there. And when you can walk the walk and talk the talk with the other investors out there, we're able to meld both the legal world and the practical world together to help educate our marketplace and how to be better at what we do. And so seminars or such as this, uh, the title training here just helps us be better to understand our industry and our business. Yeah, guys. So if you get an opportunity, you there's quite a few people that are already clicking on this thing. I got one question and then we're going to start wrapping up. Okay. So here's one last question. I have to sort through some of these. Uh, if there are two tax liens filed by two different tax lenders, yep. does it matter who filed first to see who has the superior lien or is there no difference when it comes to tax liens? Absolutely. Whoever... The very first thing I said was we are a recording state. We are first in time. Right. So we filed first in time as the senior lien holder. And if there was a second tax loan filed, maybe for a subsequent year, they're going to be in a junior position to that first tax lien holder. So okay. if your lien holder forecloses, the first tax lien is still out there on the property. But okay. first is not true. If the first one forecloses, it'll wipe out anything downstream. Okay. If that makes sense. It does make sense. All right, guys, see the link here. I'm going to, there you go. You got it. it. I was just going to break that out, but I don't have to point that out now. You don't have to point that out, guys. Go to the, the, the owner finance network.com. The yeah. owner finance network.com. He's got a lot of content on there. Um, a lot of stuff to guide you through if you want to. Uh, I would think the first thing to do, in my opinion, and, and I don't know what you would say to that, but um, is to do the, and I don't, I'm not getting any benefit from it, guys. I just know Scott and he just, he's done a couple things for us and helped us go through some loan docs and some other things and some seller financing and, and has solved problems for me within like less than five minutes. You see how he's answering these questions. It's crazy. Um, so I would say just sign up for that thing. I'm not getting any money from it, but it would be cool just to have a community of knowledge-based people, right? To really know, hey, there's a foundation here and this is just how things work. I saw some really cool questions and I mean, some comments in there. Uh, guys, if you can't read the screen, why are there prorations on taxes on real estate sales? Uh, what happens if I transfer my title, title to my business, my trust, my LLC, my children? Uh, what's the difference between a title commitment and a title policy? Uh, a lot of people don't know that whenever you're getting into this stuff, I mean, we just had one. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> there was a miss up at the title. We all approved it. And, and the day before uh, we had a closing was supposed to be on Friday. I didn't like the way the docs looked on uh, Thursday and uh, we assigned this property. 
there's three heirs, so husband and wife, but the husband had two children that lived out of state. Okay. So the way it's divided up, people are thinking that it should be divided up like 50, 50. Right. And so it wasn't divided up correctly uh, when it came to the distribution of funds. And I, and I was telling the team and I told the title, I was like, look, do not send this stuff out there because you're going to have to mail this stuff. And I get it. You're going to have the wet signatures, you have the doc, you know, all the stuff you got to do. Um, you got to know how this, at the end of the day, there's a distribution of funds that has to be signed guys on some of this stuff. And you have to know what's going to happen because the title might not see it all. So what ended up happening was they sent it out. Um, how did they send it out? I think they send it out 33, 33, 33. And it really was supposed as far as percentages and two thirds. And it really was supposed to be, she gets 50 and the two heirs get 25 and 25. And that's how it was supposed to be. So guys, simple stuff like this can mess up a full transaction. The money was already sent. The seller was upset with us. Then we had to describe the whole thing. I mean, it was a mess. You don't want to have to go through that. I mean, we've been doing this for years and the uh-oh happened just because someone wanted to rush through the process. And so we have to pump the brakes and go, wait a minute. Like we're all going to close. We're all going to get there. So they had to give the money back. And I was like, man, that's a tough thing to do because they were already at odds with each other. It's not an easy thing to do to get money back from an heir that already doesn't like you. All right. <laughs> so, um, guys, uh, Gabe, I got the same thing going on in my office right now, too. Really? Either known or unknown heirs. We don't know what it is yet, but it could relate to the exact same scenario. And again, the more info we can gather, it helps all of us do this stuff better because if we don't do it, you get drawn into a lawsuit. We all get drawn into the lawsuit. We want to. Yeah. Whoever's connected to that thing. Comment real quick, Gabe. You know, we have this thing here that you have on the screen called the Owner Finance Network. And we created that because um, we were getting so many questions from the, the, the marketplace around Texas. People did not know what to do. They didn't know where to go. And Right now, from what I've seen, if you are in the creative finance business, there is a great chance that somewhere along the way, I touched you at least once or, or, or more along the way. Um, some of the, the, the largest people out there in this industry were either trained underneath me. We either started their, their companies. Um, some of the r and Grant. Grant Kemp was my partner for six years. He was a smart guy, sharp guy, learned very well. He did a great job. I could go on and on and on, but what we did was we vertically integrated the, the creative finance business. So we provide the legal services, title services, if and when needed. We have our own RMLO services today with the OFN loan processing. We are now creating our own loan servicing company that is up and running here uh, right now, I believe, uh, brand spanking new. Uh, anything to do with the seller finance industry, we created that to make it a one-stop shop to make that more lucid for the industry out there and a, a little bit easier along the way. So they weren't hunting and pecking as what to find. But um, I've enjoyed at least talking to you, Gabe. I'm not used to talking to a, a virtual audience out there per se. And it's been a lot of fun. And I hope I didn't call you on the spot too many times. No, I love it. <laughs> I refrain from a lot more things that I normally do and whatnot, because it's kind of fun doing those things. And uh, yeah, hopefully it's been a benefit for you and for your audience out there as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, for sure. I want to share this real quick, guys. Hey, look, um, this is what we do. So um, I run Vertical House Buyers. So this is my business is the real estate investing business. We do um, everything from... Um, wholesaling deals, flipping properties. We've been flipping properties for years. I, I tell people I've been rehabbing properties for about 13 years. And, uh, and I say that because we started off as a construction company years ago. And uh, I'm very grateful I got out of that business to go and pursue stuff that I really enjoy doing. Then uh, we do stuff from there. We JV with a lot of people, run the networking group. We list properties. I mean, you name it. We do pretty much everything on the residential side. Um, if you need help running comps, if you need help with your business, 
give us a shout. They'll get to uh, that phone number there, 832-263-2613. That will shoot you back to me or Lou or Maria, and we'll be able to help you out. Definitely negotiating with sellers, definitely working through this tricky stuff. Um, this is the stuff where really um, we shine the most because I've spent years learning how to do this stuff. Um, and it's never ending and it's so fun to do. And you're probably leaving some money on a table and you're probably leaving a couple sellers out that really needed your assistance. But uh, if you don't know how to navigate it, you won't be able to help them out. And that's how we get paid is helping people move on. You got to create value. And this is the value. Uh, we joint venture with on projects of all types, especially with wholesalers. Um, and so also we are buying all types of stuff. So we're buying land. We have land projects going on right now. Um, mobile home parks or, or whatever you want to call them, manufacturing homes. We're doing those RV parks. And then of course, single family stuff. And we've been doing some rural things. I mean, we've been looking into doing everything. And now that uh, we're connected with Scott, we're connected with Grant. Um, we're able to do a lot, a lot more. And it's really fun and really exciting. So um, Scott, thank you so much, guys. Click the link. Um, you'll see his stuff on there. I'll post it back again. And then after this is done, I'll just, I'll tag him in it. So that way, if you guys want to know more from Scott, uh, there's like unlimited stuff and there's not one video, not one three hour training, three week training. It's not going to give to you. <laughs> all this stuff you got to walk through the process and have someone like him help you through it so that's about it scott you got anything nope just thank you so much for wanting to have me talk to you, you and your group we appreciate that greatly and i look forward to coming down and doing it in person one day here soon when all this mess is over and we can get back to normal again sure for sure all right guys thanks a lot i appreciate you thanks for everything and uh we'll talk to you later See ya. Bye.